Welcome back, everybody, to the Meeple Marathon and our continued coverage of Dwellings of Eldervale. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to set up and play the game. But before we jumped into that, I did just want to show you guys what everything looked like uh, set up and everything placed into the included game trays system that came in the game. So we basically, in the last video, unboxed everything and it was a big mess all over the table. So let's take a look at how clean it looks like inside the box. Uh, what I have done here is uh, I've, I've carried the box around. It does not seem to be too bad. Uh, it doesn't feel like overly um, lopsided to the point I could still like put my hand in the middle and carry it around. But what I did want to do is give it a little test here. I have set the box on its side so that if you did want to display the box with the uh, especially you know I have the alternate uh, dead croc cover um, is everything going to spill out uh, do the game trays work so this is just a good test so let's go ahead and ooh, set this sucker down and see how everything looks <laughs> Oh, and one other thing that I failed to notice during the unboxing, but there's just uh, this really nice print inside the um, inside the lid, which is just nice. Nice touch. So, uh, basically, um, I tried to see if this stuff could go in in a different format that I could pull these uh, cardboard boxes out and not have things just slide around, but that just, you know, everything is pretty much meant to fit in the way um, they show you in the back of the, the manual here. So, uh, essentially the manuals and everything fit nicely on this side. Uh, the manuals are the largest thing. The board, you can see, is not quite, doesn't quite fill this space, so it's not going to get, like, smushed or anything like that and your player reference card. So all the flat stuff sits on top of these boxes here. All right, and again, these are just empty because I don't have the um, Monster Miniatures expansion. This is just the, the basic version. Okay, so these are the trays here. Uh, you can see that uh, even with me having turned everything upside down and sideways, these tokens are staying in place. Um, nothing's falling out. Uh, I added the stickers up here, they went on easily. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got one, two of those. So there you go, same thing with here. Flip it upside down, shake it around. The cards slide around a little bit, but that there is room. Um, you know, there is enough, enough space in here that I believe if you're gonna sleeve these, that they'll still fit. So that's kind of why they slide around a little bit plus you want to be able to get them out of there all right then we have all of our um uh kind of player trays here i'm just going to pull one out and show one off just to make sure having turned it on its side for a little bit yep you can see that the the rooftops got a little cattywampus but that was about it everything else stayed exactly where it was supposed to be so there are those and these all fit down now, uh, four, uh, two, two stacks of four. One thing I did note when I was trying to put these back in is that you can't really drop in like a stack of four and then uh, drop, in, drop in the other stack of four next to it. So, um, you know, everything's designed to fit in here really tightly um, so that stuff doesn't move around. Okay, uh, we also have these. These are the token trays, um, and uh, you know I'm assuming that game trays probably the lids on here are nice and secure. Uh, probably designed these so knowing that they had this much space to work with and could go that high. Uh, I feel like these are really skinny, um, and like the coins just barely fit in there. I divided everything in half, obviously. These are really skinny. You know, you basically get a finger's worth in there. Um, I don't have the wooden resources, so I'm not sure how well those fit, or like the gold coins, uh, or the gold coins the same size. Uh, but anyways, obviously the cardboard resources fit in there. 
um, the stuff did not pop out of the, uh, you know, the big cardboard um, sheets extremely well. So just keep that in mind if you are watching this video before you receive your copy of the game. Um, just be careful punching this stuff out. Um, sometimes things can get ripped a little bit. So, and I also did want to point out that the if you wanted to keep all of your magic cards in one tray, uh, obviously you would not be able to sleeve them, but they do fit just barely. I mean, literally like they are slammed up against there. They are not going anywhere, but this is probably what I will be doing. Uh, I don't see myself sleeving these uh, anytime soon unless this becomes like my all-time favorite game. This way I can just, especially playing solo, pull out one of these and just set the other one off to the side. So there's the resource trays and how they look filled up. Let's pull these last two out and you can see that they go in here a specific way that, um, you know, there is a somewhat of a cutout here for them to rest in and down. Um, so you can't just throw them in there willy-nilly. Um, so you got your elemental tiles here uh, that can be pulled out depending on what you're playing with. And then your ruins tiles sit on this thing because you're always going to play with those. Your monster standees are here. There is room, I guess, if you purchase the legendary option. They're going to give you little standy cardboard standees for the legendary monsters because there's plenty of room here for extras. Um, I'm honestly not sure where these are supposed to go. If you um, have the full complement of everything, I guess maybe in here you could put them in there um, because this would be where the Frost Giant and uh, Minotaur miniature or some other, some miniatures, um, two miniatures are supposed to fit in these spaces. Obviously I don't have those. Um, but down here, these are like your tactics tokens and mother of dragons. These gray dice are for the monsters to roll. Um, and the orb tokens, the watcher token, um, and these right here, I can't remember what those are for, um, I'll have to check on that, but, I, you know, everything I own is out, or everything that came in my copy of the game is, is in the box right now. And last thing is, uh, unfortunately, the only place to keep the cards is over here, which, it's not super difficult pulling these boxes out, but... Um, you know, it is what it is. Um, these replacement cards were to replace all of these starter cards. They had swapped out the warrior and the, um, mage. The warrior needed the potions to summon and then warrior needed, or the mage, they gave the hammers and it was supposed to be the other way around. So those cards were just to replace these. I don't know why I'm keeping those, but I am. If I had the sound effect spaces, they would go in here, and then these boxes would be replaced by the monster trays that would be included in the um, those additional expansions. But for now, that is what everything looks like tucked away in the box. Let's get started with how to set up the game. Okay, so we're going to go through the setting up the game now, and uh, the upcoming setup here is going to be based on a two-player game. But the setup doesn't change for um, the up to five player uh, player limit that you can play with. You just simply need to add in more uh, elements um, and, and a few things. And it's very clear as to how many of each type of thing you add in when you up the player count. So obviously the first thing you need to do is choose your faction that you're going to play with and everybody else uh, needs to choose their faction because that um, uh, everything goes from there uh, in the setup based on the elemental factions that you choose. So I'm going to choose the earth elemental faction and I have, you know, the two options here. So I could play as the Mosswood Trolls or as the Elves of Briardale and I'm going to go with the Elves of Briardale. So you would simply take your player tray and you've got all your fancy stuff here and you're going to take the lid off and you're going to set this down really this just represents your your uh player ready area so when your workers who you can go ahead and pull out the first three uh, workers so anytime your meeples are ready uh in the ready state they're just going to sit on your board here this also reminds you of your special powers for um 
uh, who, you know, whoever has special powers on your team. So you definitely want to keep this in front of you. And the only other thing you really need to do at this point, or that you would want to do, is a pull out your trackers here. And then you also want to give yourself one of every resource. Um, they say in the rule book that you could store away your player boards with one of every resource in here if you wanted. And I have um, started to do that, but I actually have not played with uh, the green uh, faction yet. So the ruse can stay in here, all the rest of your meeples can stay in here, and for now, your dice can stay in here. Um, there's no reason to pull them out yet. So also, you wanna make sure you go ahead and pull your starting card out for your faction. They're all exactly the same. Um, you know, the back's the same. It's just at the end of the game, you're gonna be able to score this card based on where you are on the uh, element, on your element. So make sure you have your uh, starting card. You've pulled out your top three workers here and you've pulled out these because we're gonna, we're gonna make use of these here in just a second. All right, so the next thing you wanna do is uh, choose the other uh, elements that are going to be in the game. Essentially, it's the player count plus two more elements. So in this two-player game, obviously the green uh, elemental tiles, the green um, monster, and then you know, standee and card are included. And let's just say, for example, that my opponent chose the, the black uh, faction. They're going to be playing on one of the black factions, so we went ahead and made sure we had the black elemental tiles, the Death Reaper, and the, the Monster Standee. Now these other two, they can be chosen by you uh, or the rest of the players. They can be added in randomly. Uh, for, for this setup, um, how I've been choosing my people randomly is I simply am shuffling up the monster cards. You know, I shuffle them up without looking, deal out however many I need, and that gives me the other elements that are going to be in the game. But essentially, it's your player count plus two. And again, you're pulling out the three elemental tiles for each color, the monster card and the monster standee, or the miniature if you have the deluxe versions. Um, and while you're pulling out tiles, you can go ahead and pull out the basic ruin tiles. So you've got your dungeon, the mill, fortress, portal, and the mage tower. Uh, these are in every game. These are like these standard locations that are going to be present in every game. Uh, if you're playing four to five players, there is a second dungeon tile. So you just want to set those off, set those to the side for right now. Okay, so once you've established all of the elements that are going to be in your particular game, you're going to come to the uh, elemental board here and you're going to take your um, orbs and you're going to put A, you're going to start by putting two on the glory track. So one here on four and one on seven. First people to reach those spots on the glory track gain those orbs as reward. Then you're going to take the remainder and you're going to put one at the top of each elemental track that is in the game. So for in this instance, we've got um, the order class, the, um, what are these guys even? The dark class, darkness, I can't remember what the black guys are, earth and light. Um, and you can go ahead and take your particular tracker and place it on the starting level of your element. So you get kind of a boost in your element. You can also take your, one of them, put them next to the glory track. You don't put it on the glory track yet, you put it off to the side. You'll place it on this uh, starting glory track space once you have uh, officially uh, regrouped, brought your people back. And then uh, once everyone has regrouped in the game, that's when the uh, peaceful phase has ended. And then you're gonna set um, three of your trackers off to the side. They stay in the middle, but honestly, there's not enough room to really put all of them in the middle. So I just set them off to the side. So that means if you're playing, you know, eventually that means I can work my way up all four elemental tracks, but this is only a two player game. If you're playing anything more than a two player game, that means you're only going to be able to climb up four out of the five or six or even seven element tracks. Um, so if you were playing a larger game and you actually had say five elemental tracks in here, and let's just say for example, we were also 
playing with the purple track. We can do that right there. You can choose to remove yourself off of one track and start at the bottom of another track. Now, if I were all the way up here on the light track, I could not just jump over here to the purple track. But anyways, um, you're only ever going to have three extras. So don't feel like if you're playing in a uh, bigger multiplayer game that you're missing some of your counters because um, you're not. And then the last counter is going to go up here on the, um, you know, the scoring track that goes around the outside, the, the victory point track. You're going to want to, at this point, roll, and you're realizing that that's just barely off camera. Um, you're going to want to roll to see who the first player is, second player, third player, fourth player. So uh, just like the numbers here, first player starts on the first track, second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, so basically, if you're going last, you're going to start with, in a five-player game, you're going to start with five VP. In a two-player game, let's just say this is my other person here, they are going second, so they're going to go right there. They would also take their thing here, put that there, they would do this, and they would do this. Assuming in a two-player game, I'm green and my opponent is black. So this is what the elemental board is going to look like um, at the start of the game. Okay, so now we need to set up the tile, the map, the initial map, and the tile pool that you're going to draw from. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the ruin tiles that are always going to be in every game and are always going to be at the start of every game. They're not going to be hidden deep within the draw pile. You're going to set those off to the side. You're going to take your uh, four elemental, four sets of, um, well, in this case, four, but all your elemental factions, essentially, all the ones with colors on them. You're going to take these up and you're just going to give them a nice shuffle here. And what you're going to do is you're going to draw a number of these out based upon, again, the player count. So for a example two player game, I'm just going to draw five of these out. Um, and then there's five ruin tiles. So that's going to be 10 starting tiles. Um, if you were playing a three player game, you would draw seven. And a four and five player game, you're going to draw eight. Now, um, some people might think, oh, you just randomly um, kind of deal five out face down so you don't see what they are, and it's going to be a surprise. Well, that is not how it works. So now that I've given these a pretty decent shuffle here, we're going to set this stack down and we're going to flip them over one at a time uh, until we get to five. Because if we draw more than one monster layer tile, we actually are going to put that at the bottom because we only want one monster out at the beginning of the game. Otherwise, the board's too small and more than one monster would just be overwhelming. So right off the bat, didn't plan that, but there is a monster tile. So let's just kind of set that off to the side and let's see if we draw any more. Two, three, four, and five. Okay, so... We did not draw any extras, um, so we have one monster. So there could be a situation where you have zero monsters uh, during on the initial map. That could happen, but you can never have more than one. So I'm just going to take the rest of these that are already shuffled, and I'm going to place them in this tray here and set this off to the side. This supposedly is a uh, discard area for your treasure tokens. Um, if you care to use it. I know that a lot of people are like, what the heck is this used for? Uh, but that is what it's supposed to be for discarding your treasure tokens. But for now, just set that off to the side. Then we're gonna take the five elemental tiles we just drew, the five ruin tiles that we just drew. We're gonna flip all of them over and we're gonna give these a shuffle. Now, uh, there is a specific shape you are supposed to make the map. Uh, once you get these shuffled and that shape is going to differ slightly depending on again your player count so there is you know once i'm sure you played enough you'll probably get to know this but you can see right here this is going to tell you a how many elemental tiles uh you're going to have and you can see in the four and five player count you actually have six ruin tiles because you have a extra dungeon tile but it's also going to tell you the shape um there is nothing in here about how you build out uh, this shape. I start on the left and build to the right. Usually you could start in the middle. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, you, but just remember you are shuffling these up and however they come out, that is gonna be Elder Burial 
for your game. So let's get this out of the way and place our map. Um, this is just how I do it uh, in particular. Again, you can do it any way you want to. So I put out my first one and then I go top and then bottom and then I move over working my way to the right. All right. And again, how you put these out here is entirely up to you. This just happens to be how I have decided to place mine out. Now, uh, what you do want to take into account uh, is try to avoid situations like this where I have built it quite close to um, my uh, elemental board or any other part of the game because this map is going to grow. All of these other tiles here that we placed off to the side are going to be added and they have to be added obviously around the edges. They're not going to go over top of other tiles. And someone, when they place a new realm tile, may want to put it right here. Well, that means you're going to have to shift the whole board down. So um, just keep that in mind when you are building the map. Make sure you have space around the outside. There's enough room to build. And then what we're going to do is we're going to populate all of these little squares that are on the elemental tiles only. Um, obviously the ruined tiles don't have any of those, but don't get mistaken by any of those symbols. And for each one of these, you're going to simply go to the uh, dungeon board, which look like this, and you're going to take a stack of three. Now these nice game trays, you should have stored them away in stacks of three. So you're just going to pull out one stack, um, for each area. And so like for this example, it's gonna get two stacks. And you can go ahead and flip them over. You need to flip over at least the top one because people need to be able to see what uh, resource they're getting. Um, I tend to just flip them all over. All right. And so we're just gonna sit here and we're just gonna populate all of these now real quick with um, oops, what we need. Okay, so um, remember there's only three of each elemental color out there. So there's only actually one more light and one more green out there. And each of those respectively are only gonna have one more spot to put things at. Um, but yeah, that is essentially, you have set up the board. And if there is a monster layer on the board, you're gonna wanna go ahead and place the monster standy or miniature, whichever you have, go ahead and put that in there. And now the map is set up. There's just one last thing we need to take care of before we can get started with the game. All right, so up here are our dungeon trays. And uh, you can see that we have pulled out the treasure tokens from a lot of these. The only thing you need to do is take the top card of the elements that you're playing with. So in this case, we have these three on this board. and then green over here. So these are the um, kind of starting adventure cards. They're called the door cards. You can play uh, an alternate variation where you just shuffle them all up and, and those get placed wherever they end up or at the bottom. Um, but the standard game, those are always on top. You're gonna leave the other ones face down so you don't accidentally look and say, ooh, that purple card there is very nice, let's go buy that one. Um, so you're just gonna leave those face down because of the game trays, you kinda always have everything out. Uh, technically, if I had picked just these four, which I have done for, for sake of space and setup, you could say, I'm just gonna play with these four or I'm just gonna play with these four and then you only need that uh, dungeon tray out. But essentially you have prepared the dungeon tray area. You've got your player area set up um, again and we are ready to go. 
Okay, so this uh, next little section here, we're gonna talk about how to set up the uh, Ghosts of Elder Vale. This is essentially the solo AI. So if you are not interested in seeing how the solo AI gets set up, you can skip to the next bookmark where, we'll, where we will start talking about how to play. Um, but for now, uh, what you wanna do is pick a uh, faction color. They recommend black, which is what I've been playing with, but honestly, you can play with any color you want. But I went ahead and decided we're going to be playing with black. So you're going to want to go ahead and pull out all of the meeples right off the bat. They actually gain access to all of these from the very beginning. Um, you can leave your dwellings in the trays or the roofs in the trays, or you can pull them out. You could leave your dice in the tray for now, or you can pull them out. It really doesn't matter. Um, but you definitely need to go ahead and pull out all these and you also need this watcher meeple here i'll explain how that works in the how to play section um, when we get into it essentially all he really does though is follow your character around whenever you place a worker or uh, advanced worker out the watcher follows them around and that's going to um, decide where the ai is going to go on their turn so um, then you're going to take this uh, Ghosts of Elder Vale board. Uh, as you can see, mine's curling up a little bit. I wish they had done this with a thicker card stock or even like the, the full cardboard. Anyways, um, so you're going to need the Ghosts of Elder Vale board, a whole set of meeples, the Watcher meeple. You're going to need the Ghosts of Elder Vale deck. This is essentially their action deck. And then you're going to need one uh, treasure token of each of the elements um, that are in the game. And so they are assuming um, that if you're including the AI, you're playing solo. And so it's only gonna be a four faction game. And you can see there's only room here, one, two, three, four places for four factions. I guess you could finagle it and try and figure out how to make it work with um, playing multiplayer and throw the AI in. But for now, obviously this is just meant to be a two player game. So, um, you're gonna take the action deck, you're gonna shuffle it up, set it off to the side. You're gonna have the watcher ready just for now. Then you're gonna look here along the bottom and you're gonna set up their meeples on these spaces. Now the, um, the warrior and the wizard and the dragon are always gonna be in the same spot. And for now, for the workers, all you need to know is that you're putting out one, two, three over here, one, two, and then a single one. But the numbers that are above the workers are going to matter uh, later in the game. Because once the uh, AI starts putting dwellings out and isn't pulling all of its workers back during its regroup phase, you're gonna see that you're gonna put them back onto this board in numerical order. So this first slot's always gonna get somebody unless he's placed his sixth dwelling. Uh, this guy, however, uh, the first time he dwells, you're not going to be putting a guy in the sixth spot anymore. And why this matters is because as you, when you activate the AI, you're going to roll a single die. And a one, two, and three, you're going to activate this grouping from left to right, four and five, this grouping from left to right, and six, this grouping from left to right. If at any point, say these guys are gone and you were to roll a six, that is when the AI is going to regroup. So um, it does matter that this, uh, the six becomes just the wizard after a while. And the last thing you're gonna, or not the last thing, but second to last thing you're gonna need to do is set up the ghosts board is you're gonna take these four treasure tokens. So this does mean that the last elemental tile when you're playing against the ghosts that comes out for each element is going to actually only have two treasure tokens to be able to stack on it because you already stole one from that very last stack. So just keep that in mind. But just take these, give them a little shuffle up in your hand like this, and then you're gonna randomly pull them out like this, plop them down, face down like that. All right, so you now have established anytime they roll a, uh, a die, if they roll a one or two, they're gonna be looking for darkness, a three and a four, light, five, earth, six, order. Okay, then what you're gonna to wanna to do is take your ghost AI deck and you're gonna take the top three and you're gonna deal them out like this. Um, 
You can just kind of slide them under there like this. Okay. And we're gonna talk about what all this means later, but essentially you can see this top card tells you in comparison to the watcher, which is this symbol here, where, uh, what adjacent tile you're going to attempt to put a worker in. Uh, and so if you roll a six, you're gonna take this worker and you're gonna try and put them in that spot relative to the watcher. Remember the watcher has been following you as the real player around the whole game. This one he's going left, this one he's going right. Uh, if at any point this realm tile doesn't exist, say the watcher's on the edge of the map, then he goes into the same spot as a watcher, which probably means he's going to go into the same spot you are and activate a battle. Um, again, there's a whole lot of other stuff on these cards, like uh, getting a new adventure card. Here you can see you roll dice. That's where this comes in. We're going to talk about all this on the how to play section uh, in a little bit. But for now, just setting up, know that you're going to deal out three each time. You set this deck off to the side because then every time you activate one of these cards, you remove it, discard it, draw the new one into its slot. <clears throat> the last thing you're going to do for the Ghost AI is you're going to give them um, kind of like their starting faction um, per se. So you would roll this and you would say, okay, I'm going to compare. And so they are going to get a bonus light door. So they're actually going to get the, the top light guard, which is the door. And it's just going to go face down next to their player board here. Um, and um, yeah. Um, again, all of their cards that they take as resources or gain as bonuses are played face down. It doesn't matter what's on the front of them. Um, you would also take that um, one of their pegs here, their particular peg, and you would place it on the opening track of, for in this example, the light track. Two quick things that I forgot to mention uh, earlier on. Uh, during setup, when you were to have taken one of each type of resource, you should have also taken five magic cards. Uh, you can look at these uh, in a multiplayer game. You can keep those secret from your opponents. Uh, when you're setting up the AI, you're also going to give them five magic cards. These can just go face down. Again, they're just going to count those up as raw victory points at the end of the game. So basically you just handed them five victory points and that's about all that matters. Uh, the only other thing is that there are these gray dice. There's five of them total. Uh, they don't fit in any player board. They're stored at the bottom of the box. These are for the monsters. So even though the monsters match the elements, uh, when you roll for the monsters, you're going to be rolling these gray dice. The maximum that they'll ever roll is five. So you've got your five dice, just set those off to the side somewhere. You won't need them again until you fight a monster. So let's go ahead and get started with how to play this game. Okay, so on your turn, it's actually quite simple. Uh, you basically have two options um, of actions, one of which you need to take. You either need to place a worker out on in, into the realm, or you need to regroup, which means you're going to take all of your workers that are out in the realm, bring them back. Uh, some of them may be over in the underworld, which is located at the bottom of the elemental track. Uh, that means they were killed in battle. But basically you bring everybody back um, and are getting ready for the next round. So obviously at the beginning of the game, you are going to want to put your worker out somewhere. So there are some placement rules to consider when you're putting out a worker. But essentially, when you put a worker out, you either put them on one of these ruin tiles, which have specific actions that you're going to take. We're going to talk about all those in a little bit. Or if you put them on an elemental tile, you get to gain a resource. You know, this is a worker placement game. So you're putting your worker out to retrieve a certain resource. Well, those resources are represented by these treasure tiles. Um, so for example, this one, I get my choice of either one coin or this one would give me either a gem or a scroll. Whenever there's a dash, um, it's a either or. So this one, for example, would give me a hammer and a gem. Um, and uh, this one is a gem or a scroll. So this is the simplest action. Put your person down, you pick up a tile, 
and we're going to talk about what you do with that treasure tile, but essentially that's a resource that you're gathering. Now, what resources do you want to gather? Now, that is part of the strategy, um, but here are some of the things you, you can do with resources. You can uh, summon your remaining workers. So you can see here there's a very specific payment you need to make for your three advanced workers. And these are all the same for all three factions. Or anytime you see this treasure chest looking symbol, that means it's any resource. So to get your remaining workers, um, the first worker is going to cost you a single resource of any type. The next one, two resources of any type. And the third one, three resources of any type. So thinking about who you want to bring out on your board, uh, could depend on what resources you go after. Remember, you're starting the game with one of everything. Also, keep in mind that every faction's workers have something a little different. So, my wizard has a special ability. I may want to uh, bring out my wizard before my warrior or my dragon. Also, my workers have a special ability. So, I may want to bring them out before anybody else. That's entirely up to me. Also, the name of the game is Dwellings of Eldervale. So obviously building dwellings is a very important part of the game. And that's when these funky little hats come in for the meeples that turn them into dwellings. It's a roof hat. Um, but essentially, in order to get to this point where you can turn your meeple into a house, you're going to need to dwell, which other means you're either going to the mill or you're doing it on your regroup action. But when you dwell, you're going to have to pay the cost that's in this little box right here. So you can only dwell in elemental tiles. You cannot dwell on a ruined tile. And if, say, this spot is already occupied by another house, you cannot dwell there. Um, but if I wanted to dwell in this location, I would need to spend three gems. Uh, whereas down here where the monster is, I only need to spell one gem. But obviously there's a monster guarding that one. Uh, or over here... I only need to spend two. Now, the reason this one is more expensive than the others is that I'm gonna to get to go up on the light elemental track two spots if I dwell here. So again, keeping that in mind, how, where do I want to dwell and what resources do I need to dwell to get there? The last thing that you um, will, that will kind of drive your decision as to what uh, resources to go after is oh, your adventure cards. So I'm just going to pull this down here for a second. You can see that um, when you take an action, for example, going to the dungeon, which allows you to place a new realm tile out and then buy two adventure cards, each adventure card has um, a certain amount that it needs to be purchased. Now, this uh, little setup of symbols is a little confusing at first because you might say, oh, do I need a certain amount of order in order to purchase this card? No. What this top symbol means, and they're all on this, they're all going to be this in the order stack, is that you get to move up one spot on the order elemental track. So going up on the order elemental track can be done by purchasing adventure cards or by building dwellings. Uh, there's a third way that we'll talk about a little later. Um, but to buy this card and add it to your tableau, you need to pay what's in the black banner here, two scrolls, or here, two hammers. You can see this is one of the advanced cards because the AI already took the door card here, takes three scrolls. So depending on what adventure cards you want to purchase, uh, depends on what resources you might wanna go after. So again, your action, I covered a lot here uh, of strategy, but is to simply place your worker in a realm and take the action that's provided. In an elemental tile, that is simply to gain the treasure token that's on top. If you there's two stacks, you get to choose. And, um, you know, we'll talk about how you turn those into resources here in a little bit. Now... Let's talk about these other ruined tiles while we're here. If I were to go to the mill, and it doesn't matter who you send. I remember these are still workers. This dragon is still a worker. He's just an advanced worker. But depending on who you send here, uh, if you send someone to the mill, that means you can build a dwelling. Now again, you have to have a worker, just a simple worker. You cannot 
put a roof on top of the dragon. It just, it doesn't work. Okay, the only uh, workers that you can turn into dwellings are actual workers. So you may very well want to send your wizard, warrior, or dragon there. Um, but as long as you have an eligible worker in an eligible elemental space, which means there is no other dwelling there, and you can pay the cost, you can turn that worker into a dwelling. You're going to score VP when you do, you're going to move up the elemental track, all things that are good towards winning the game. If you go to the Mage Tower, you can spend any two resources. Again, remember the chest is like a, a symbol for any resource. You can spend any two resources to gain three magic cards, all right, from the stack, and you're going to have to discard one. So it's essentially like buying two magic cards for any two resources, except you kind of get a little bit of a choice. You can trade in two magic cards, pay two magic cards, because magic cards are a resource, to get three new magic cards. Say there's two in your hand you're never going to use. You can trade them in, get three Discard down to one. All right. The portal is uh, summoning one of your workers. So if you go to the portal, if you send a worker to the portal, you simply need to be prepared to pay the cost to bring in a new worker. If you go to the dungeon here, the dungeon uh, pushes the game. So the more people go to the dungeon, the faster the game is going to finish because you're gonna be putting out a new realm tile. So you would simply draw the top tile from the stack here, add it to the edge of the board so that it's touching at least two other um, tiles. So you could not just stick it right here or you couldn't just stick it right here coming off the end. It would have to go here or here or here. Um, it can't just, you can't create like a, a bridge with a little island uh, or a peninsula. Um, but essentially you're going to place a new realm tile and if that realm tile ever or the draw stack runs out you trigger the end game so if you've placed out all your realm tiles that were part of the game you trigger the end game if one individual builds all six of their dwellings you trigger the end game um, but after you've placed out a realm tile you may purchase two adventure cards now you need to be able to pay for those adventure cards um, if you cannot, if you can only buy one and then you don't have enough to buy, buy another one, then you can simply cycle one from the top of its stack to the bottom and then reveal the next one. You could also do that, uh, I guess, at the beginning. I don't think there's anything in the rules against that. So say you really want a specific elemental, you want to be able to move up a specific elemental track. Um, but you don't really like that, say, green card, but you want to move up the green elemental track, you may take your first adventure card action to cycle one to get to the next one and then hope you can pay for it. Um, the last place <clears throat> you could go is the fortress. This is taking any two resources and turning it into two gold resources. Gold is a wild resource. So this would mean that if you say have a ton of hammers and you want gems because you want to dwell here, you would need to go here to exchange your goods for gold and then gold can be used to pay for anything else. It is noted in the rules that if you go to one of these ruin tiles, you have to be able to take the action. So you can't squat here on the mill and say, I'm gonna go here to semi block the other people from going there, but I can't afford to dwell anywhere. If you go to a ruin tile, you have to be able to take the action necessary. I cannot go here if I have zero resources to trade in for magic cards. Um, putting a worker uh, out does not block anyone else from coming there, but it does mean that if someone else enters the same spot after they have taken the actions, a battle ensues. And we're going to talk about battles here uh, a little later. Right now, we're just talking about what you physically need to decide to do on your turn. And that is place out your worker. Okay, so I told you we would discuss this. Um, 
what do we do with these treasure tokens once we go to the elemental regions? They're essentially giving you the resources that you need to, um, you know, progress through the game. So let's say, for example, I have placed my worker in this region and I'm going to take this one because it's a double resource. What do I do with it? Well, you have a couple options. You can immediately trade it in for those resources. So you could trade this in, you could discard it, you could give yourself a hammer and a gem and place them into on into your player tray here. Um, there's a spot, a specific spot for each resource, and you can have up to five um, of each resources. This is for the coins. Or you could take it and you could slot it into one of these um, positions right here. This is like saving it because say you have um, more than five gems and you're planning on spending a little. Um, if you were to trade this in right now, you would lose that one gem. So maybe you want to save it because you want to make sure you get that gem. Or you're saving it to place on an adventure card, which is another thing you can do. You can take these treasure tiles and instead of trading them in for a resource at that time, you could do something like this and place it on an adventure card. Um, because when, let's slide these up here. When you regroup, you're gonna, as you bring people back off the map, you're gonna be placing them onto these locations like this. So this is why you have a starting card because this is gonna give you three options to do, three actions to do when you regroup. Regrouping is not just bringing your people back and allowing you to start fresh the next round. Regrouping, there's a lot of strategic decisions you need to make when you're regrouping. So as you're regrouping, you can assign a person here and you can summon. You can assign a person here and gain a hammer. If I were to slot this in here and I bring somebody and assign a person here to regroup, I get a hammer and a gem. So maybe you don't just want to trade this in because it's a double. And if you assign someone here, you can dwell. We'll talk about all of this in a little bit, but I just wanted to point out that you can slot these treasure tokens into these squares that you can see vaguely on these adventure cards. So then if you are coming back, regrouping, and you assign someone to this card, you're going to get two gems and a hammer. Now, to be able to get the hammer and the extra gem, you need to be leading on the earth track. We'll, we'll talk about that rule in a little bit, but just keep in mind that that's what you do with these treasure tokens because they're not just resource, grab those resources and chuck this off to the side. You can save it, you can turn it in immediately for said resource, or you can slot it, or you can save it and then slot it once you get that adventure card you want. But these are all strategic decisions that you need to make with your uh, treasure tiles. Okay, so the other action that you can take on your turn, if, especially if you have no workers, this is the only action available to you, instead of placing a worker out, you can regroup all of your workers back to your player board. Now, as you do that, you will be placing them, assigning them into the onto these action adventure cards um, and gaining you know, the action or the resources in real time. So the order in which you assign people to these cards does make a difference. Uh, and I will note that you can only um, assign people to adventure cards who are coming from the, the realm. If you have lost a person to battle and they're coming from the underworld, you simply just bring them back. You do get them back, but they come directly onto your player board. You cannot assign them. So be careful who you throw into battle. Now, say for example, I have uh, in my possession one gem and one scroll. I am one gem short of bringing out my dragon. Well, I can take my first worker that I'm regrouping with and I can assign him to this adventure card. That's gonna give me a second gem. Now I have enough that I didn't before the ability to when I bring someone back, I can assign them to the summoning phase. I can pay these resources and I've now summoned my dragon. If I had gone to the summon spot first, I would not have been able to afford my dragon. Um, if you summon someone, summon 
a worker during the regroup phase, you simply just add them to your player board. Once you have assigned everyone and everyone's back either on your adventure cards or on your player board, then you simply just take all your workers, put them out. That ends your turn. You don't get to put anybody out this turn, but um, you now have everybody available. Um, the only time you don't get them back is if you've turned them into a dwelling. Okay, so we've talked about your, your basic actions that you need to take, either placing a person out in the realm or regrouping all of your workers. Now, there are some free actions that you can take uh, interspersed within your basic actions. For the most part, you need to take these on your turn, not on someone else's turn. But um, a lot of them we've already even discovered. Um, many of them uh, focus on the treasure tiles. So as a free action, you can trade in or discard the treasure token to gain the resources. You can also, as we've talked about, uh, insert a treasure token into your tableau. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, then when you regroup and you activate that card, you're gaining the uh, additional resources. The other thing that you can do as a free action is use your orbs. Now, we talked briefly about how you gain these orbs, basically making being the first to, to make it to the end of the elemental tracks or being the first to reach these two spots on the glory track. When you gain an orb, you can simply place it on your player board um, and then as a free action, you can spend it when you wish. Um, one of the common ways is to place it up here on the orb rewards track. And you can see here there's various spots. You would simply just place your reward, say you need two gems immediately to pay for something. You would place it up there and it stays up there. That means no one else can claim that specific reward. So this is three VP, this is two VP, all the way down to three swords, um, two money, a money and a, you know, but basically once one of these is claimed, the orb stays there, you don't get the orb back, you've spent it, you're done. The other way uh, is that you can actually play orbs just like treasure tokens onto some of your adventure cards. For example, this one, um, if you have purchased this adventure card, if you bring someone back and activate this card, you roll a die and you basically get the benefits based on your roll. If you have um, placed an orb on this card, you get to roll the die twice. So just some added benefit. Or, for example, you could get one that looks like this, which is similar. When you bring the guy back, you have to, um, you know, you activate the card. Well, in this instance, you have to have slotted something in here that you pay the cost of. So you could, for example, do something like this. And you could say, all right, I'm going to pay a magic card in order to roll my dice and then my die one time, and then I get this. But if you happen to use an orb to slot into this position like this, the orb represents free, nothing. So you've effectively made this so that when you activate this card, you can roll a die for free and gain the benefits, which is really nice in this instance. The last thing that you can do as a free action are um, play your magic cards. So let's just take a look at um, uh, some of them here. Uh, for example, here is a quest card. It says, you know, it looks like a ship in, in the background here, and this says, to complete this quest, you must win a battle with a wizard. So if I include my wizard in a battle and do it uh, at any point on my turn, um, most likely I would do it immediately. I would play this card, gain four, uh, VP and move about my business. Um, this one, however, is a spell. So you um, would play this. There's no cost at the top. So basically it says play on your turn, gain one VP for each of your units in the underworld. Return them to your ready area. Okay, so that's just, and again, this is free and a free action. Whereas some of them like this have a cost at the top. So in this instance, to play the plague spell, you either need to be on level three of the darkness track, which would be one, two, three, right here, or you can pay two potions in order to move all units in Elder Veil to the underworld. For each potion a player spends, they may keep one of their units. So you're basically putting everybody, uh, you know, this is a big card, which is why it has a cost. Um, the last type of magic card, that you can um, have is really not one that you're gonna play. Um, 
these are more end game. The eyeball represents things that are going to, you're going to hold on to this for end game scoring. So you wouldn't really play this, but the eyeball cards um, are for keeping up with and holding on to till the end of the game. And so those are all the free actions that you can take. There's a couple more actions that you can take that are involved with some of the mini expansions uh, or variants you can add into the game, but I'm not going to cover those here. Um, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is battles. Um, battling is not a um, you know, core part of the game, um, but it will happen. Uh, they're meant to be quick. They are very random um, because it is based on dice rolls. But essentially what you're going to do is anytime you enter into a space where another unit is, um, you know, more than likely I would have had to have done this, um, you can't place your first unit into uh, an occupied realm. Um, there's a few special abilities that let you do it, but for the most part, you would have needed to have, say, place someone up here. But say, for example, I have my dragon and I place them here. A battle, once I have completed my actions first, a battle is going to ensue with at least these two um, workers. Now, for my dragon, and you can see this on your player board, I'm going to get three dice. I also get a bonus die because I am adjacent to a dwelling, a realm with a dwelling, or if I was in a realm with a dwelling, I would get a bonus die. I also have the option to have this worker join me if I wanted to, he would add another die. For this guy, he is a, you know, lone worker here, so he's going to bring one die to the party, and he could also bring over an adjacent worker to add a second die. So once you have established your dice pool based on, and the maximum is six, you can't roll more than six. So if I happen to be in an area where I can drag in all my people and I'm surrounded by dwellings, I still maximum would roll six dice. Um, you're going to take your dice, you're going to roll them out, and you're going to look for the highest, let me just pull these back into camera view here. You're going to look for the highest die first. So in this instance, you can see the highest die for the Underworld character or the Darkness character is a four and mine's a five. So I have won this battle. That's how simple it is. You're simply comparing dice. If this ha happened to be a five as well, you just kind of push those aside and then you look for the next one. Well, I have another five, he's got a one. That does mean, however, if this had been their role, even though I brought a dragon to a fight, and even if I my roll looked something like this, where I've got tons of fives and he's got a six and say a two, he still wins. It's highest number on a single die wins. Anytime that the highest number is met, you push those aside and you move on to the next die. Um, generally, if you bring more dice to uh, the fight, say you had done this and then, um, you know, his looked like this, to compare the next one. All right, so that all compares out. Even if all my other dice were really low like this, he still has nothing to compare, so I would have won. But there is always the opportunity for a single lone person to take out an entire army of people um, just by simply rolling the highest number out of them all. Uh, battles, um, are handled the same way with monsters uh, and in fact by placing my dragon here I would have drawn this monster in this monster in particular uh, maybe not but for the most part anytime you place adjacent to a monster you're going to want to check their card usually they're going to rush into your space here and there uh, you, know, you would look at their card here you would find the winged serpent um, <clears throat> you would look at his text here so you can see that technically the winged servant might not always rush in but you're basically going to roll once you count up your dice if i placed here in the winged serpent this guy's going to be dragged in as well and so say all of this is what our battle looked like the ai is going to add this and again you're still looking for who has the top die so again even just this one lonely guy if he's the only one that rolls a six could defeat us all. Um, the more dice you roll, obviously your odds of rolling higher are better, but that's how battles work. If you uh, are battling just another player, you get to move up one spot on the glory track. 
uh, and gain the benefits there. If you defeat a serpent, or I mean a monster, you also move up on the glory track, but you're also going to get to move up on the elemental track. So that is how battles happen. Okay, so once you have triggered an end game um, condition, either you've placed out the last realm tile or someone has placed out their sixth dwelling, um, you're going to move into the, the scoring phase. And um, essentially the scoring phase is all centered around how far up each elemental track you are on. Um, the first thing you're going to look at is if you happen to have an orb that is unspent, it's 1 VP per orb. Most of the time you're going to go ahead and have spent these, but uh, you do get credit for those. Then you're simply going to look at your elemental track. And for each level that you've reached, you look at the number next to it. And so here I would score 4, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. You add all those up onto the VP, good to go. Then you're going to look at your dwellings. For your dwellings, you're going to score based on what element that dwelling is in and how high you are on the elemental track. So this dwelling is going to score me four points. This one, however, is only going to score me three. Even though I'm green, it doesn't matter. I only moved up this far on the green track, so I'm only getting three points for that dwelling. Next, you're going to do the same thing for your adventure cards. So, for example, these two adventure cards, which are both Earth Elemental cards, are going to score me three points apiece. But you can only score a number of adventure cards based on how many dwellings you have. So, in this example, I have two dwellings. I can score up to six adventure cards. Um, if I happen to have seven cards in my hand, seven adventure cards, and only two dwellings, I would have to choose one not to score. So basically it's three adventure cards per dwelling that you are allowed to score at the end of the game. But essentially you go around, you say, all right, three times two here, I definitely have less than six, I would score an additional six more points. Um, last thing you're gonna wanna do is score any magic cards. Um, that have end game scoring, or sometimes adventure cards have these vault effects that give you end game scoring, you would add all those up. And essentially, whoever is furthest around the track is the winner of the game. Okay, so the last portion of this video I'm dedicating to um, how to play the solo AI. So if you're wanting to play this game by yourself, you would get out the Ghosts of Eldervale. We've already discussed how to set up the um, solo AI. And so this is essentially just going through the steps that the solo AI will take on their turn. First thing you're gonna do is simply roll out one of their dice. In this instance, they've rolled a six, so they're gonna take the leftmost worker on the in their six area. They're gonna take this worker and then they're gonna look at the card below it. In this case, they're gonna try to move into the realm that is immediately to the right of the watcher. Uh, remember, the Watcher is following around you as the active player. If there is no realm there, they go into the spot with the Watcher. Um, <clears throat> then they would attempt to construct a dwelling. Uh, we're going to talk about all of this here in a second, but essentially you activate this card with the worker, the leftmost worker. You would put that card off to the side and you would draw a new card. Um, then, if, for example, you rolled a six again, and this is what the board looked like, the Ghosts of Eldervale would do a regroup action. They're going to gain two VP immediately for any ghost that they pull off of a ruin tile, and they're going to gain one VP for every ghost that they pull in from the underworld. So they actually gain benefits from pulling in their dead. They don't have a tableau of cards. They don't activate any cards like that. Um, if their placement action places them on an elemental tile, you'll simply take the top uh, treasure token from the left pile. If the left pile is empty, then you move to the right. Or if there's just a single pile, you take the top one. You flip it over and you place it on the track based, you know, uh, matching its other colors here. So you can see that as they move further along, they're gonna gain benefits once they cover up these spaces. So if I cover up this space, you know, first of all, I would put here, but then if I come here and I cover up this space, then I'm going to gain a magic card for the ghost. Magic cards are simply just one VP for end game scoring. But if I were to be, say for example, filling up the yellow track here, imagine these are yellow, um, I get to advance them on the glory track. 
here, um, when we get here, they're going to take an adventure card in this particular color, which means they're moving up the elemental track as well. Um, so if I were to put here, I would take a green card. If I were to place here, I would take a black card. This card, however, tells you to place your worker down and then take a new adventure card. This one, you're rolling a D6 to determine what color card. So in this instance, I'd rolled a three, so I'd be taking a yellow card. Um, and so that's essentially what you are doing on the ghost's turn um, for, um, for their action. So let's take a look at some of the cards that you'll see for them. Okay, so let's say, for example, this is kind of what the realm would look like when the ghosts take their turn. And they rolled, um, you know, six. They're going to take their regular worker, and this is the card they would see. Um, so you're going to take this card, and you would place the worker in this space based on where the watcher is, and you would roll to see what type of adventure card you got. Now, let's say, for example, this was their card. They would go here. Remember, they're ignoring the actions on here. They would take a new realm tile. Oops, sorry. They would take a new realm tile and um, place it on the board. You, as the player, get to choose where it goes. This example, however, they're wanting to go right here. Well, there is no spot for that. So what they're actually going to do is pop into this realm tile, and a battle is going to ensue. <clears throat> and in this example, the same thing would happen. They would want to go here, there is no tile there, so they would go here, and a battle would ensue. Well, they also want to construct a dwelling. So, what is going to happen is, before a battle ensues, they're going to take care of this card. And in this instance, they are on a legal spot to construct a dwelling, so they would actually turn this meeple into a house, become a dwelling, they would gain the VP for that dwelling, but then there is no one to fight. My person is just here, occupying that realm, and there is no longer a worker to fight. That worker has become a dwelling. Now, say for example, the um, worker happened to come into here. And, um, well, let's just stay here. Because again, they couldn't come into this dwelling, so they came here, and they have a person here. Now, they cannot dwell in the fortress, that's not an option, but then you look at this, these symbols around the outside and moving clockwise around, they're gonna say, can you construct a dwelling here? No, here, no, here, no. This is number five, option number five, yes, you can. This person is here, they're by themselves, um, there's no one else that's dwelled here, they don't need to pay the resources, so they would turn this guy into a dwelling, then a battle would ensue here. Um, but if, for example, at any point in time, I were to have been here like this, and this is the same situation, then no. There is no opportunity for them to dwell. Or if they had been here, and this guy had been here, nope, doesn't work, because this guy's not in an elemental space. Or if this guy was way up here, again, not in an adjacent region, you're not gonna reach way up there to create a dwelling. Um, so there you have it. There is, however, one card in the deck that you might see. It's the special dwelling card that will actually place this person ignoring the watcher directly on the mill. They would be placed on the mill, and then if there's a viable worker that they can turn into a dwelling, they would. So then this guy would become a dwelling. There are some other cards that tell them directly to go to a particular ruin tile. So they would be placed here, and then this one actually has you reshuffle the ghost deck. Um, and then this one would have them place on the portal card. This one, you're actually bringing a monster back in from being undead, and that monster would destroy, send to the underworld, any units that it came back into. So these are just some examples of some of the ghost cards that you might see come up during the game. Other than that, um, that's pretty much how a turn works for the ghosts. They, when they do battle, they gain a bonus for a bonus die for any worker they have in the underworld. But other than that, they pretty much roll um, just like anybody else would. They're always going to um, draw in other workers from adjacent territories to add to their battle um, to try and maximize it. They do have to fight monsters. If they happen to be moved into an adjacent space next to a monster, they will have to battle a monster. They can defeat monsters. Um, and pretty much their end game scoring 
goes exactly the way a human would go, except for um, they count all of their adventure cards no matter how many dwellings they have. So they're gonna gain a lot of adventure cards, probably gonna have more than they have based on the dwellings to card ratio, but they get to count them all. Again, they're counting them based on where their token is on the elemental track. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, that is how you play the game and how you incorporate the solo AI. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, up next, I'm going to be doing a full playthrough against the solo AI. So you can see not only how the game plays, because essentially my actions as the active player against the solo AI are exactly the same. Um, and you can see how the solo AI activates. Um, and then I'm going to try and get a small game group together. Whether we have to play outside or not, we'll see. But I'm going to try and get a video posted of a multiplayer game so you can see how that functions as well. But keep an eye out for that uh, coming up next. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.